Um, hello, listeners. Uh, thank you for joining us today in the privacy talk. I'm very honored to invite the Karin from New York this moment. Uh, she's an expert of the city development, uh, working on the New York City this time. So great to be uh, joining us uh, this moment today, Karin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, let me start uh, to introduction of her background. Uh, she's a senior vice president at the New York City Economic Development Corporations, leading creative and applied tech strategies to promote economic development and entrepreneurship throughout the city. This includes emerging tech initiatives, such as the New York's blockchain strategy launching the first public funded VR AR lab in the country and spearheading the city's strategy for the responsible development of AI and data. Karen is also an attorney, entrepreneur and a startup advisor. She was the principal of her own law firm advising tech startups on corporate issues financing an overall business strategy. As an entrepreneur, Karen founded ActionCom, an educational platform explaining public policy issues and providing resources for people to take actions. Karen also founded Stanford Startups New York, a business network of over 800 Stanford entrepreneurs and investors in the region. She is an advisor to several tech organizations and also board of trustees of Mott Hall, a middle school in the South Bronx, raised in Queens. Karen has a BA from Stanford University, a master's degree in public policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and a JD from George Washington University Law School. So it's very honored to be a uh, participant with you, the Karen. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. So uh, let's move on to the today's agenda. Um, I'm very inspired from your uh, past activities uh, because I'm also the entrepreneurs to establish some uh, activities uh, here in Japan. Um, the, my first question uh, with you is about your uh, startup activity, uh, ActionCom. Um, I, I think the, you have uh, many reasons the why you started this company. So could you tell us about your background and why uh, did you start and motivated these uh, actions? Sure. Um... And again, thank you for the invitation to, to be a part of this conversation today. Uh, Kohei, I started Action Cam around the time in the United States when the Affordable Care Act, which is the health care policy, uh, was about to be implemented. And um, it's commonly known as Obamacare. There were a lot of questions that people in the United States had about it, a lot of concerns people had also whether their health care insurance was going to no longer be applicable, um, who was going to get access, costs, et cetera. There was a lot of confusion. And I remember at the time I was practicing law at a law firm, um, and I turned to some of my colleagues, fellow lawyers, and I had asked them about their understanding of the Affordable Care Act. And we had a lot of questions. Um, we, had, we were confused. And I thought to myself, Everybody has access in some capacity, whether it's through computers or through um, phones, smartphones in particular, um, just a tremendous amount of information is available these days. And I thought that there's so much um, information that's inaccurate information at the time. So this was about 10 years ago. So you can imagine how relevant this is today, particularly in the United States. But there's so much information that's online that people don't know what's accurate, what's inaccurate, what reliable sources are out there. And especially as the internet became more and more um, relevant and applicable and people can e easily upload their own content, 
citizen media, everybody could put out some sort of a blog post, a website, put in comments. I think there was a lot of confusion as to what is really going to be the implications of this policy and how is it going to affect people. And there was a lot of fear. And so I thought to myself, there needs to be a place, a platform where you could go and learn about different perspectives, but from reliable sources. Mm -hmm. So I I want to feed people a particular perspective as to this is going to be something that's fantastic or this is going to be something that's the end of your opportunities, you know, when it comes to healthcare access. I wanted a balanced perspective of what are the positives, what are the concerns that people have, but to make sure that they were grounded in reality and in fact. So that's why I started Action Cam. It stemmed from the Affordable Care Act and a lot of the misinformation that was out there. But I also wanted to make sure that the sources that we were uh, turning to were um, not only reliable, but they were also easily understandable by the everyday person. You didn't have to be a lawyer or a policymaker or an economist to be able to understand uh, the information, but it was something that was engaging that people would want to better understand and could better understand these issues and how it affected them. So that was the main reason why I started Action Cam was because these policies are so relevant to everyday life, everyday people and everyday people's lives that I thought it was incredibly important for us to have a place in which we could actually stop and have very deliberate, meaningful conversations and be able to listen to one another and um, speak in a common way about what the concerns were so we could address the problems that were associated with these policy issues. So it started with the Affordable Care Act, um, which is, of course, health care insurance in the United States. It was also expanding it to address immigration reform and some of the bipartisan measures around immigration reform. Um, gun control was another issue, uh, what was happening in Syria as well as another issue. So it expanded so that people could better understand what are a variety of perspectives. Now, the funny part is, is I was actually thinking about this, you know, the name of the company was Action Cam, and the idea around that was um, ways that people could, like I said, getting engaging um, uh, information. So it could be in video format, infographics, et cetera, but ways in which they could also take action. So ways in which, so in, in the Affordable Care Act example, where could they find local community groups where they could sign up for health care? Um, you know, what are ways in which they could not only learn about these policy issues, but take it to the next level? And I've been thinking, you know, I've recently been thinking about Action Cam. And I had contemplated changing the name, uh, you know, 10 years ago from Action Camp to actually calling it Act in Fact. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that it was, uh, you know, the motto would have been uh, Fact, Act, Impact. That was mm -hmm. the motto around Act in Fact. And I thought it was um, funny to think about right now because I never officially could change the name, but it's so relevant to everything that's happening in the United States on a political level and on a societal level, which is, you know, people adhering to their particular political affiliations, their news sources, people not listening to one another, um, people not necessarily listening to the facts either. And so having a space, a forum, a platform in which we could have constructive dialogue, but we also are working off of a foundation of fact, reality, grounding this conversation on any policy issue or any current events issue with a common language and a common framework, I think is more important now than ever. But we saw the need for this stemming from, you know, a decade ago, if not more. I see. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering that's the, I think the uh, easy to find is the one way to join the political support in the sense. Uh, but the, I suppose that we have a, a one other issue such as how the people can easy to understand the policy, the advantage for them direct. Uh, since I've been working on the local politics before, but a lot of the people is no way to find it. They also no access uh, whether they are uh, applicable or not. So this is a big problem. How they can 
uh, join the political advantage uh, through your service in a platform? Then there are any changed uh, since you have started those initiatives? Yeah, I think that there are several layers to it. I think part of it is um, in terms of access for everyday people to these types of discussions. I think a, 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 the most basic part is, uh, I think, education. You know, mm -hmm. making sure that everybody can understand and, and everybody has access to the information um, and not the same information from the same sources. You know, information from a variety of perspectives. Um, I think education is the number one issue. And a big part of that is making sure that policymakers, lawyers are able to take out the more technical aspects of whatever the issue is, whatever the policy is that they're working on, and make it so that everyday people like myself uh, would be able to understand it. I think that's part of the job of um, you know, policymakers, lawyers, and also the media to help people understand, but help people mm -hmm. understand with not a particular goal or perspective in mind. It's stating the facts. I think that's one part. I think a second part is, um, you know, kind of thinking and building off of this idea of education is digital literacy also, um, mm -hmm. and thinking about what is the information that we're getting online uh, and being able to question where are the sources of this coming from is this being doctored? You know, um, is it, are these pictures actually real pictures? And being mm -hmm. able to think about um, all the technology that's behind this, all the people that have access to putting this information up, and anybody can put up a website right now, but better understanding not only what's on the internet, but what their data is being used for. And I think that's incredibly important for all of us to get more of an understanding about. I think as our data is being used more and more, this is going to become even more important and it's incredibly important right now, but people need to know mm. and better understand the information that they're easily disclosing, not only voluntarily disclosing, but through their actions online. Um, what, the, what the platforms that they're using is what information they're actually co collecting from these users and how it's being used. So all of that, I think, comes down to a better foundation around education. And I will say just on a bit of a tangent here, aside from the education, which allows for access, I think an incredibly um, important uh, step after the education is thinking about um, economic opportunity. So the goal, and I think you know, many, many people believe this as well, is that if you have access to really sound education, you'll have more opportunities when it comes to your career and job opportunities mm -hmm. and economic development. And I think that ultimately building off of the education that people can get to think critically, to better understand information, um, to ask questions, um, and to be able to be advocates for themselves and understand technology and data um, all of this builds on ultimately people being able to have, um, you know, careers and being able to live a, a dignified life where they're able to have jobs and be part of the workforce or be entrepreneurs. And um, that ultimately deals with, you know, a city, a state, and a country's and global economic development. And if you're not able to provide for those opportunities, and evolve with these evolving technologies, um, it's going to be a big problem where you have a tremendous disparity between those that have access to education and opportunities and those that don't. And I think that we're seeing a tremendous rift throughout the world, um, but particularly in the United States right now as a result of this. And so from my perspective, um, there's a lot that needs to happen. It needs to focus on education, economic development and opportunities for people, and just a sense of community and building a sense of how do we sit down and listen to each other and better understand each other. Um, I think those are three imperatives uh, for us to be able to provide access across the board. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Dadia. Yeah, that's uh, I think education is the one way to fill the gaps in between the, uh, the technologies the citizens uh, go come together. Uh, I think this is the very key part of the uh, sticking it to uh, 
uh, be the purpose making this through disadvantage. Uh, otherwise, the, the technologies are coming, but people is don't know how it is. And also the people is been the peers of the technologies, just, uh, oh, where is our data? So this is not, nothing that happens. It's very no meaningful. I think the, your education saying is a very important to uh, come together uh, for the best practice, especially in the public field as well. Uh, so I think the, I want to move to the, the next uh, your activities as well. Just that uh, you're working on the Stanford Startup New York, uh, where it's supposed to be a place to bridge the new technologies into the city development. And uh, how, uh, how does this activity is linked to the city development? Because the uh, many tech company is uh, uh, w w coming from the Stanford network as well as they have uh, many uh, institutional actions. So, what what is the advantage for the cities to use their resources? Yeah, you know these um, alumni groups across the board. So, of course, you know Stanford's one of them, but um, across. Um, a variety of different colleges and universities. They have alumni groups and they also have, you know, current students, whether it's undergraduate or graduate students that are currently in New York with our city college uh, um, network here, our uh, state university schools that are here, Columbia, NYU, uh, Cooper Union, across the board, we have a number of really strong schools that are here. So whether it's current students, um, faculty, or alumni groups like you know Stanford is is quite far away you know on the other side of, of the United States but there's a pretty sizable alumni population that's in New York and the reason why I started it there were uh, two other alumni as well who went to one went to a graduate program in electrical engineering and another one was in an MBA program and the three of us were curious as to whether there was a, a pretty strong entrepreneurial community and investor community of Stanford alumni here in New York. And we thought, well, let's put this group together to provide a community and networking opportunities for this ecosystem and let's see if it's big. And it actually was rather large. We had tremendous demand for um, people to be able to network with, with, with each other. And these types of groups are, you know, essential to the development of the tech ecosystem here in New York. So about a decade ago, under Mayor Bloomberg, during his administration, he wanted to diversify um, the, the various industries so that it's not, you know, mostly focused on finance. And so he wanted to make sure that, and his administration wanted to make sure that there was a greater diversity and tech was core to that development in New York. And so as a result of that, uh, the ecosystem building focused on clusters, and that is, you know, bringing together groups of people so that they could exchange ideas, they could network with one another, they could work together. And that's essentially what these alumni groups do as well, right? It's like these clusters of people who have um, some common experience, but some reason to come together and be able to be the investors, the entrepreneurs, the project managers, the business people, the lawyers all come together and to develop ideas, to start businesses and to be able to scale them. And so what the city of New York ended up doing, you know, a little over a decade ago is essentially what these groups, including, uh, you know, our group, the Stanford Startups New York group is about just bringing together community and being able to develop a community of people who are helping each other uh, mm -hmm. to innovate. And that's essential to the city's development. And that's one of the reasons why New York City is ranked as the number two tech ecosystem in the world by Startup Genome for several years now is because a huge uh, benefit that we have is that we've been able to develop this type of community and we have a number of investors that are here. We have the workforce that's here engineers as well as people in a variety of disciplines across the board that are critical to uh, a company, a startup uh, growing. We have academic institutions across the board um, and we have, you know, diversity of people and ideas. And so these are all critical factors in being able to grow a tech ecosystem. And these groups like Startup Stand Up, Stanford Startups New York is like a microcosm of that. I understand. Yeah, that's a very interesting um, stories of why uh, this tech community is uh, 
uh, influential to the city developments. And uh, I want to succeed in the, from the parts to the transitions. Uh, I think the New York City has uh, many uh, histories um, to come to uh, today's developments. Uh, so uh, what is the uh, basic story of this development uh, from the past? And uh, what is the roadmap uh, for the futures uh, through uh, using uh, those resources? Yeah, I think that, you know, as I was, you know, to build off of what we were just talking about, Kohei, with the development, particularly of technology here in New York, um, as I mentioned, it was to think about diversifying our industries, uh, especially after the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. And over the course of the past 10 years, we've been able to grow a pretty sizable tech community here in New York. As I mentioned, we had very critical factors and a big one is thinking about our people, the workforce that we have here. We have uh, a tremendous number of engineers and developers that are here in New York. And one of the factors that the city had taken into consideration was developing a program to build an applied sciences hub here in New York, which ended up being awarded to Cornell and the Technion, which is a collaboration of this applied sciences program over at mm -hmm. Roosevelt Island. And so ensuring that first and foremost, we had people, we had the talent that was here and that was growing here, that's been critical. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, any strong development of a tech ecosystem has to have investors, has to have strong institutions, has to have a community. The number of startups that we have in New York has been growing tremendously. We have over 9,000 um, startups that are here. And uh, we also have you know, a tremendous number of meetup groups um, you know, groups like Stanford Startups New York that provide resources and communities. So we have all the critical factors of the tech ecosystem that has been critical to help grow it here in New York. But I, I do want to underscore that across any industry, the most important factor has been New Yorkers and our people. And we're so proud that we have such a diverse group of People who are New Yorkers, we have you know 8.6 million New Yorkers that are here, over 40% of which have been born in another country and are first generation immigrants. You know, people from every background, every religion. Um, we are so proud of our diversity, and with that, people are able to bring so many new ideas. You know, what works, what doesn't work, from all over the world, and um, you know, this diversity of thought is compounded with the diverse industries that we have here in New York and the creative sectors that we have. And so all of that has formed an opportunity for people to come together and to innovate. And so the story of New York, even before tech development, has always been a story of diversity, uh, diversity of people, diversity of ideas, um, and this you know, kind of can-do attitude. If you can't make it in New York, you can't make it anywhere. You know, There's that sense of ambition and that sense of this is a place to be to make whatever it is come to fruition here in New York. So that's always been our story of development, uh, regardless of industry. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I have checked that, that the you've been working this moment and the, you have a, a responsible in the tech sectors. Um, so the why the New York is uh, able to uh, work on this part is the, it's just a word that has a uh, inheritance to community that's a very significant is to uh, see the history, the futures of the city developments. Um, for the next is I would like to move to the more practical actions that you have in mind. Uh, the one is just the AR and VR of. Uh, which is the you part of uh, in this moment? I had checked the the one article at the weeks in 2018, uh, where you have mentioned about these uh, laboratories. So, what do you, how do you expect those technology will be integrated in the city's development, and what could be the benefit for the people living in the uh, in the regions? So I'll start kind of from a global perspective or a macro perspective and come down. And I think that overall we've seen globally the importance of technology um, in innovating, creating new types of products and services. 
the tremendous opportunities that there are in workforce as well as entrepreneurship. So technology is becoming more and more important globally um, because of what it can produce, but also because of the opportunities that they afford people and communities. And so that's just kind of on a, on a huge level why we're interested in technology. And then bringing it down to some of the specifics, we had put together a strategy around building an artificial, I'm, sure, I'm sorry, a virtual reality and augmented reality lab or VR AR lab. And um, the goal of this was in, to ensure that we have uh, an emphasis on mixed media and mixed reality and ensuring that industries that New York is known for, whether it's the fashion industry, media, whether it's real estate, whether it's healthcare, all of these various industries, just to name a few, are going to be using more and more of this kind of technology and have been for a variety of purposes. Um, so this has started for a few years, this uh, virtual reality and augmented reality lab. Part of it is to help spur innovation and in startups. Part of it is to help these legacy industries adopt these technologies and learn more about these technologies. And another part of it is focused on workforce development to ensure that New Yorkers have opportunities and are trained to be able to work in these fields. Now, interestingly enough, I think that VR and AR are really good examples of over the course of the past nine months, as COVID um, has, has undertaken our world, what we're seeing is that these uh, mixed realities, virtual reality and augmented reality has become more and more relevant, right? When we're thinking about how are people you know, the, engaging with entertainment? How can you have these simulated environments in which you could have training? You know, um, how are you thinking about these simulated environments as well, where people are able to interact with each other? And so we're seeing this further push in regards to these various interfaces mm -hmm. and the importance that they're going to have, the relevance that they're going to have more and more so in the future. So that's just one example of the kind of the speeding up of the adoption of technology and the relevance of that technology. And then other examples, as you had mentioned, is you know, the work that we have done in building the blockchain strategy for New York um, and uh, you know, some of the other uh, examples of you know, the artificial intelligence strategy that we have also for New York. It really builds on how do you use these technologies for three purposes. The first purpose is thinking about innovation, thinking about how do you help companies start and scale in New York, innovating entrepreneurship, that's the first one. The second one is thinking about how do you ensure that there's a workforce that's trained to be able to have jobs in those companies. And these are good jobs. These are jobs with um, increased opportunities for career development and growth within these companies and other companies. And we want to make sure that our workforce is being educated to reskill and upskill as these technologies are becoming more relevant mm -hmm. so that they're able to partake and get access to these uh, opportunities as well. And then the third reason that we're thinking about all of this as well is that, you know, as we're thinking about the growth of our industries and the evolution of our industries, how do we make sure that they remain on the cutting edge? that they're actually able to integrate these technologies and move forward as we all move forward uh, you know, globally around adoption. So those are the three main areas that we're thinking about. And Kohai, you had, you had asked earlier about um, you know, the development story of New York City and mm -hmm. where do we go from here? And I would say that when we're thinking about our VR AR lab, when we're thinking about our blockchain center that we had or our mm -hmm. civic tech competition for blockchain or the New York City Center for Responsible AI and our strategy around that, all of this centers around the future of, the, mm -hmm. of New York City and where we're planning on going. And all of this centers around making sure that all people in New York, all of our neighborhoods, are able to get access to these opportunities as entrepreneurs or as uh, mm. people who have opportunities in jobs, you know, good opportunities in these jobs as well. It's really about equity and access, equity and opportunities. And that's really the current and the future of what we have been strategizing around is to build on making sure that every New Yorker 
is able to partake and has opportunities when it comes to being part of our economic development because we are the sum of our parts. We're all, we're all of us. And mm -hmm. so we can't let anyone or any community, any of our neighbors um, fall through the cracks and not have these opportunities. So that really is the future of New York City is ensuring that we remain at the forefront of technology, but we're doing so in a way that is thinking about equity, that's thinking about impact, that's positive for all of us. Um, and it involves, you know, a lot of our values and thinking about the ethical implications of these technologies, both regarding the products that are being developed, but also who has opportunities and access to these technologies, both from an economic development perspective, but also when it comes to just, you know, being able to use them. So another project that we're doubling down on focusing on right now, again, the pandemic has very much underscored mm -hmm. and highlighted the discrepancies of access to the internet. And so the city is undertaking um, uh, an effort by which we are expanding broadband access uh, across the city, mm -hmm. especially to those communities that have been hardest hit by the pandemic, to make sure, again, when we're thinking about equity and access to technologies, getting access to the internet is just foundational. And so that's another effort that we're focused on. So as we were talking about where we've come so far mm -hmm. in terms of the city's development around tech, I think that's been a foundation to making sure right now we're at a space and a place in which we could take all those resources and those partnerships that we've developed and take them to the next level to make sure that New York City is strong for everybody and is mm -hmm. a place for opportunity for everybody. I understand. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Uh, so in, in terms of the accessing the technologies, uh, we will make an automatic the processing uh, such as the uh, AI or other, those kind of the technology will be integrated into the city development in the futures. However, we, we are in the controversial whether the AI is uh, in the bias or AI is in the perfect for the citizens, uh, the choice. So I think that in New York is also the one of uh, uh, fastest development, this technology into the cities. And uh, how, how do you think uh, to protect the, the citizens' privacy with the AI? Uh, you, have, uh, you had uh, interviews in IBM about the AI, the skill set is a very important, uh, as I mentioned. So what do you have any idea with that? Oh, sorry about that. I would say, yes, you know, when it comes to um, the balance and making sure that people's data um, is protected and it's secured, but at the same time, we're thinking about the benefits that artificial intelligence could help forward. You know, this is, these require very difficult conversations, um, and, but they, they, need to, they need to happen, right? And so I'll give the example of thinking about the benefits that AI can reap when we focus on areas around the technology uh, being used to process vast quantities of data when it comes to healthcare or mobility, or when it comes to thinking about um, climate issues or urban tech in general, I think there are a lot of opportunities for us to focus on ways in which we can use artificial intelligence and to give like just a lot of practicality around that. When we're thinking about COVID-19, one of the first, um, and I mentioned this in the same podcast, one of the first, uh, flags that we had about um, a pandemic that was spreading was actually two weeks earlier than the World Health Organization indicating that there was some sort of a problem. And this was flagged by Blue Dot, which was um, an artificial intelligence company coming out of Canada. So we're seeing vast amount of information that this artificial intelligence was able to process about you know healthcare information, travel information, dispersion of the pandemic across a variety of, of different um, um, localities and nations, and was able to say there's something going on here. And so we're seeing this is a tremendous benefit. And the clients of Blue Dot were able to get a two-week advance notification about there's something awkward, you know, happening uh, across the world. Now think about the the tremendous value of that technology. How do we reap the benefits but mitigate the risks? And so, like you had said, there are a lot of ethical implications. There are, um, you know, 
thoughts around how do we make sure that we're reducing bias? How do we make sure that any kind of decision that's made by the artificial intelligence is explainable so that people understand the decision? Um, how do we make sure that there's transparency as well and accountability around, you know, if a decision's made and you want to contest the decision, who's ultimately accountable? You know, all of these need to be taken into consideration. And so part of this goes back to education and digital literacy so that people are better able to understand what their data is being used for, what is artificial intelligence, what are these technologies? So people, everyday people are empowered. Hmm. I think another aspect of it is going to be um, focusing on some of the prongs of our strategy in New York City when we had come up with the development of the New York City Center for Responsible AI. The idea was that it, this is going to be a physical space in which we would have four different types of activities taking place there. One would focus on education for both students who are higher education, let's say they are data science students or computer science students, how do we make sure that ethics is integrated into their coursework so they're better able to understand the implications of what they're developing or what they're analyzing? And how do we ensure, again, focusing on education for the current workforce that are data analysts, data scientists, product developers um, that are, you know, artificial AI, um, you know, uh, engineers as well, how do we make sure that they are learning about the ethical implications of their work and the people that whatever they're developing is going to be impacting? So what are the tools that are out there? What are the best practices that are out there? So as this is becoming more and more relevant, they're actually able to see what are ways in which they could ensure that they're taking a lot of these ethical um, considerations uh, and integrating them into their work. So the first part was focusing on workforce development and education. The second part is thinking about creating a space, a safe space where you would have industry, you would have mm -hmm. government, where there would be specific pilots, an AI application that wanted to be developed or wanted to be analyzed. And you had an interdisciplinary group of people from various perspectives asking questions about that artificial intelligence. So you have to have representatives from that industry. You have to have representatives from uh, policymakers or government, um, make sure there are lawyers there, ethicists there. But an incredibly important part is to make sure that the everyday person is there too. You have civil society and you have the communities that might be uh, impacted at the table and able to engage in the discussion about their concerns around that technology and about the data. And essentially this safe space, so to speak, we were calling an applied research lab or a sandbox. Mm -hmm. And it would analyze the end to end of the AI application and its development. So asking, should AI be used? What is it being used for? Where's the data coming from? Mm -hmm. um, whose data is being used here? Who's developing the AI? What inputs are being used? Um, what are the impacts? What communities are they impacting? And, and how is the model being retrained as well and updated? So it's this kind of cons consistent loop that we're asking about here and asking questions about. And that in and of itself, I think, is an important part so that uh, of the calculus around ensuring that there's a balance between thinking about privacy and security mm -hmm. and the ethics, but then at the same time, making sure that all of this is going to be grounded in practical development because we can't restrict the development of technology. We have to do, we have to, you know, ensure that we're innovating and we're using it for positive impacts. And the only way that we can actually do that is to make sure that we're having these conversations. Mm -hmm. We're building tools to mitigate any kind of concerns that we have, but we're taking into account these diverse perspectives because that's the only way that it's going to be able to inform and make the product better. So that those conversations, that diversity of perspective, that diversity of industry is going to be incredibly important and in creating a sandbox where these, um, you know, AI uh, applications are being developed mm -hmm. can result in best practices and tools so that those that are developing these applications are able to learn from them and ensure that their product and what they're developing takes into consideration the communities that are being impacted, uh, but also is able to ultimately create better products that are gonna help people. So those are just kind of two of the activities that are gonna take place. 
at this AI center. Um, unfortunately, as a result of COVID-19, this project itself is paused right now because the city, of course, has to focus on not only containing the pandemic, but ensuring that there's swift economic recovery for our you know, businesses in general, but particularly our small businesses. But that's the goal, is thinking about how do we ensure, again, coming back to what is the current in the future, you know, thinking for New York City's development plans, and it focuses on making sure that the products that we're developing, um, the technologies that we're developing are benefiting our people, that everybody has access mm -hmm. to these opportunities, and also making sure that at the end of the day, we're innovating and everybody has opportunities to be the entrepreneurs and the innovators. I understand. Yeah, I, I, we are now in the COVID-19, but this is this something that in futures, um, maybe this uh, pandemic uh, is not succeeding in the, like the 10 or 20 years, just uh, uh, in the beginning to uh, reforms uh, the city development. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the New York City's, uh, the, the very um, significance is to take an assessment whether this technology could be helpful uh, for all the people living in the district and to get the benefits through that. This is uh, very uh, important to uh, take a pre preliminary actions uh, from the public uh, suggestions uh, to involve the private sectors uh, into the, the policy making. Uh, this is a very knowledgeable, the insight for, for, uh, for all of us, not just uh, I'm living in Japan, but the other people live in other cities. So that's very uh, great insight for uh, information. Thank you. So lastly, I want to ask you about the message for the listeners. Uh, especially those, uh, this interview will be uh, recorded and listened by the policymakers or city developers who involves the, the good things for uh, the technologies and the cities that benefit all together. So could you uh, give a last message for all the listeners? Sure. You know, I think that it builds off of what we've just been talking about, which is um, making sure that as these technologies are being developed, um, as I was mentioning earlier, this idea of a sandbox, a place in which you could get a diverse group of people and perspectives, that includes policymakers and potential regulators. And we're hearing more and more, whether it deals with data, whether it deals with artificial intelligence or any kind of technology that's being developed right now, ensuring that policymakers understand what the technology is. They don't need to know the technical parts of the technology, but a broad understanding of its implications and how it works, I think is incredibly important, both from the perspective of if there are algorithms involved, what are the algorithms doing? What are they based on? What is the data that's being used? And um, thinking through and working collaboratively with the developers, with the people from that particular industry, with lawyers, with people who are thinking through, let's say economists or ethicists or people who are thinking about the values and incentives, you know, having the diversity of thought so that you, you know, these policymakers and regulators are able to think about what are the potential downsides of this technology or of the data being used. And uh, you know, trying to build consensus across the board as to what needs to be done and what needs to potentially be regulated or what are the discussions that need to happen. So, you know, whether that is around privacy um, uh, for particular, you know, data, for example, or, you know, personally identifiable data, or whether that is thinking about algorithms that are being used right now, let's say for purposes of media and, you know, kind of feeding specific content to people based on what they've previously consumed. And so kind of coming full circle to the beginning of our conversation, when we were talking about um, the, the importance of, you know, action cam and providing a framework by which people could get facts and get unbiased perspectives on what are the concerns, what are the pros and cons of different policy issues, you know, we need to have a platform like that in which we could have this conversation 
with policymakers, with technologists about what is the technology doing, who is it you know, uh, impacting, and how do we collaboratively as a society think about the pros and cons and how are we going to make sure that the technology isn't hurting us, um, but we're uh, taking into account those considerations to minimize those effects and maximize the potential benefits. Technology is a tool. And so at the end of the day, any tool could be used for good or for bad. And we need to have those collective conversations to be able to maximize the good and minimize the bad. And so for those that are listening out there, uh, conversations around technology, around data, these are global conversations because as we know, you know, these technologies are being used across the world. AI is being used across the world. Um, issues of data, uh, you know, our data is being used across, you know, the world as well. And so uh, these are ideas, standards that we're going to need to come to consensus around um, as a global community as well. And so, you know, I encourage policymakers to work collaboratively with the tech sector um, and to think through what's being developed, why and how. Um, to think through the data implications, whose data is being included, whose data is not being included, why, and what communities are being negatively impacted as a result. To think about workforce development implications and who has access to these growing jobs and these very lucrative jobs and how do we make sure that everybody is prepared. Um, there's a tremendous amount of upskilling and reskilling that's going to need to happen globally. And um, I would say, you know, also just as a whole thinking about how you know technology is not the answer for everything it's really just a tool that at the end of the day um, we can utilize um, but it's really the most difficult part is bringing people to the table to have these difficult discussions and come to some sort of a consensus by which the technology could be a tool to help us in whether it's processing large amounts of data whether it's maximizing efficiencies, but it's really about us working collaboratively to get to that point. Yeah, that's a great message. Uh, even we are in the very severe situations, but we have to recover uh, for not only for the economic purpose, but like to our own well-being to, to share its thoughts to each technologies for mutual developments. Uh, maybe after the COVID, a lot of the people is uh, taken a uh, to, to fly to or move to the other countries in between the some across the cities. In the sense is that we have to collaborate it in the city development, not just the remains of one cities to to share in the data or just uh, uh, such a kind of the uh, the credentials and each uh, flight evidence is need to be free comply with the uh, uh, healthcare department. So I think this is a time to share the need thoughts to how each city is working on this uh, theme and how we can co-develop in more flourish societies together. So yeah, thank you for coming, uh, coming to the, from the New York City. I'm very honored to have a conversation with you this moment. Thank you so much, Kohei. Thank you.